In the last hundred years, the saber and cutlass have been highly underrated as weapons in our society. Today, with the prevalence of the firearm, the edge weapon has taken second place. But that wasn't always the case. A hundred years ago, men realized just how deadly an edged weapon like a saber or a cutlass was and the great havoc they could wreck. In the following presentation, we're going to give you the bare bones of how to use a saber and cutlass in self-defense. Here we have a typical saber. This is our 1830 Napoleon saber. It has a heavy steel uh, scabbard. This scabbard is lined with wood to protect the blade and protect the user. The scabbard is a good weapon in its own uh, right and can be used as an impact tool. The primary fighting component of the saber is its blade. You have the long cutting edge. Typically on a saber, the first half of the blade isn't sharpened. That's where you parry with. The second half is sharpened, and that's the business end. That's what you cut with. Quite often, the top edge for about the first seven inches going towards the point is sharpened also. This is to make it easier to thrust for the blade to go in. Sometimes you don't have a perfect opening or a lot of time for your thrust, so even um, a lesser movement of this blade when it's fully sharpened will allow it to enter, even when you have a slight opportunity. So it's a really good idea to sharpen the back edge of your saber. The hilt offers both protection and an offensive weapon. It keeps your opponent's um, blade off your hands and out of your fingers and thumb. It also acts as a giant pair of brass knuckles. You can punch with it in a melee or up close in infighting. You can hammer down with the butt. So it's a really good uh, percussive weapon also. You can also push with your saber. You can bayonet with the blade at all different kinds of angles. And also you can hit with the back of the blade this way and use the back of the blade to wrap around and strike your opponent at angles uh, that he's not familiar with. So the saber can be used in um, a great many ways in close quarter combat, and it's really useful also in conjunction with a revolver and automatic pistol. Now I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Anthony DeLongis, and he's going to give you the basics of using a saber or cutlass in self-defense. Thank you, Lynn. Let's get started. The sword has got to be a fluid extension of your hand. I think one of the key elements is how you grip it. A lot of people make the mistake of wrapping their hand fully around this and turning into a club. This is bad. This makes the whole thing a heavy, dead weapon. What you need is something that is fluid and facile and that you have fingertip control of at all times. Here's how I accomplish this. I like to use a pivoting grip. I like to align my thumb along the back edge of the blade, and I release and I squeeze into the palm of my hand. If the weapon's a little heavier, I'll go to a three-quarters wrap if this gives you a little more security, but this way, I have absolute control of the weapon at all times. It's light, it's easy in my hand, I can very quickly change my angle of attack, I can very quickly defend and counterattack, but the blade is literally alive in my hand, and I'm gonna use gravity as my ally as opposed to having to fight with the weapon all the time. So the first thing is the grip. Think in terms of this. It begins at 90 degrees and it squeezes to about 60 degrees. That's the key, that this pivots in your hand. Cuts from the saber are made by extending the arm and squeezing. You can cut from the fingers and wrist like this, although don't do too much with the wrist because it throws the weapon away. Okay? It can come vertically, it can come diagonally, it can come horizontally, it can go an upward diagonal, an upward vertical. Same thing on the backhand side. Diagonal, horizontal, upward diagonal, upward vertical, like so. Okay? A lot of possibilities. Also work with the point. We'll get to that in a little while. Remember this nice, easy pivoting grip. Now let's take a look at our stance. Imagine that there is a center line. Okay? We're always fighting over center line just in any other martial art. I want control of this because this is the quickest path to my opponent. From here, my feet I like to divide. A classic stance looks like this. This comes heel out of the heel, about hips to shoulder width apart, about the same distance as one of your natural steps. Footwork should be as easy as walking, okay? My initial step is to step forward. That's an advance. Or to recover, that's a retreat. 
you see this from the side, again, I'm about the distance of my hips, no wider than my shoulders, no narrower than my hips. If I turn like so and come on guard, here's my advance, here's my retreat. Two short ones would look like this and coming back like so. I can also do what's called a pass forward where this foot comes through and I recover back to my natural on guard stance and retreat or pass backwards and retreat or advance. So my feet need to be underneath me. My weight needs to be balanced. It's equally distributed between both feet, ever so slightly forward perhaps, okay? But you don't want to unweight this foot like this. Advance, retreat, pass forward, pass back, extend, lunge. Now what the lunge is designed to do is to take the distance of two steps very quickly and drive your attack forward into your opponent. So where I would be going here like this, advance, advance to strike, retreat, retreat. From here, leading with the weapon, this explodes much faster. So when I choose the correct moment, when I have created an opportunity, I can flow into it with a very dynamic and effective attack and recover back. That would be the lunge. And that's your basic footwork. Let's look at our basic defenses. There are five basic parries with the saber. One, two, three, four, five. This first parry number one was the position if you drew from your scabbard, first position. Second position straight across. These are cavalry parries. Third position, fourth position, fifth position. To simplify, imagine that your body is cut down the middle and then cut across the side here. You have an outside, as in everything outside the weapon, and you have an inside, both in the high and the low line. So this would be a cut to the shoulder, would be, would be a cut to the high outside. A cut to the chest or belly would be a high inside. A cut to the outside hip would be a low outside. A cut to the groin or the, the rear leg or down low here at the knees would be low inside. And here is a cut vertically to the head. Those are your five positions. The three we're going to concentrate on are three, four, and five, or traditionally, tierce, cart, and quint. 